Welcome, everyone. This is uh, the writing seminar for this Arcane Together meeting. I am Professor Diegler, and this is Think Before You Write. Now, oh, that's kind of a controversial <laughs> statement, you know? Uh, what if you're a stream of consciousness writer, you know? What if you, what if you feel like you have to think while you write rather than before? I mean, you have to do both. But ideally, thinking before you write is uh, the way to go. And that's the point of this presentation. It was originally all about uh, characters and writing for NPCs, but it's since been adapted into something different. So I'll be talking about uh, NPCs uh, quite a bit going forward here. So the plan for this talk is this slideshow, uh, you know, open discussion, ask questions, and I can try to answer them at any point you feel like uh, you want to know something. Uh, give you tips, basically, on how to structure your writing. It's a lot about concepting things before you actually go into writing them. Um, hence the thinking part. And then there's uh, going to be Q&A at the end. Uh, and then maybe some reviewing at the end if I have extra time. General advice for uh, writers that I felt deserved its own slide. Three major points. And if you take nothing away from this presentation, take away this slide. I'll show it again mm -hmm. at the end. Um, but the first point is that as a writer going into game writing, you need to know that things you write down are obviously subject to change. Rewriting is a thing that happens to everyone for one reason or another. It's impossible to avoid. So you want to get comfortable with it. Um, it's okay to be attached to your writing, but make sure you're attached for all the right reasons and uh, make sure you check yourself. Like watch, uh, be objective. Try to be your own best editor, um, which leads into point number two. Uh, you want to try to submit complete work, um, which sounds like a strange thing to say out loud, but... The reality is there's a lot of drafts that don't encompass the full idea of the quest or the character. They'll leave out like important bits of whatever they're writing and then they submit it or there will be a lot of, you know, spelling or grammars or some other thing. Uh, you just basically, whenever you submit something to whatever, whatever you're submitting to, you want to make sure that it is up to your standard and you basically de define what your standard is so all i'm saying is try to keep that bar high because it will help you going down the line um and uh assume the worst and what i mean by that specifically is that you want to try and appeal to a broader audience of people kind of uh making sure that you're not locking people into dialogue or, or specific uh, quests that they don't necessarily want to accept. They'd rather do something else. Uh, and that comes with implementation perspective. Implementation, an implementation perspective is extremely important for a writer because if, if you have holes in your, uh, you know, in your, in your quest, that's a really bad, that's a one of the main causes of rewrites. You, uh, dead ends are never good, is the TLDR for that. So uh, getting into the actual part of the presentation, I thought it would be good to start out with talking about the player experience in general and the word fun. The age old question, what is fun? Because it's, you know, it's hard to define and you, you can't really define it because fun is different for other people. But I will answer this question with a question. What is fun to you? You know, think about your favorite moment from any Elder Scrolls game. It could be a location, a mechanic, a character. You know, what made it stand out or be memorable for one reason or another? For me personally, what was fun was 
the end of the Oblivion Dark Brotherhood um, quest line when I when the player gets confronted by Lucian Lachance and he's like screaming at you, like calling you a traitor and asking you what you've done. Because for me, that like really serious, dramatic, like confusing moment was really fun for me. Maybe not in the moment, but looking back on it, that was the thing that stood out to me. Um, and I think it was because it was such an important payoff for the player for a really good kind of overall plot. Um, but this is open the floor. What do you guys like? What stood out to you in any Elder Scrolls game that you've played? If you don't have any, that's totally fine. <laughs> um, yeah, but, yeah, you, you kind of have to, you know, get you, you have to go through all the, the quest lines in your head right now. Yeah. The main point I would say of kind of me asking that question is just realizing with all the different options that there are, your favorite moment is probably going to be different than someone else's, right? Uh, what you find fun or what stands out to you might not have stood out to someone else. Um, and that's what makes fun so hard to define. But people have d these different definitions. So understanding what is most kind of generally fun will help your writing down the line. It'll help you appeal to that wider audience that, um, that I talked about before. And just getting feedback on your quest ideas or your NPC ideas really does help with this. Um, and that's really all. <laughs> I had to say about fun because it, uh, it's just a good thing to keep in mind because this is our this is our goal right doing anything we want the player to have a good time playing our game it could be done through so many different ways um, knowing the way that's most broadly applicable is it will will help you tremendously down the line so we're getting into concept and quests um starting out with quests because it's the shorter of the two topics between quests and npcs i'm trying to hit on things that are relevant to people who write in the au um and actually on project um but one thing that i know students we do on project quite a bit um students are doing it more so uh as we've kind of uh progressed as the au has kind of developed um students are concepting their quests uh on paper before they're writing it which is great i know hendris did it for that uh, recent proxo quest congrats by the way hendris um you want to kind of map things out like a timeline uh have all the major story events laid out in order so that you know what points the player needs to kind of experience for the plot to progress and then once you have those points laid out it will help you keep your story contained it will help you focus your story it'll stop it from basically over branching to a point where it becomes something unbearable like obviously the player in a role-playing game could just walk into a farmhouse and live out their life on a farm uh because it's like a role-playing game uh, but you have to draw the line somewhere because if you don't the scope creep is just insane. You know, that's why video games where anything is possible are, you know, few and far between. The player should drive these events that you lay out for the quest. They don't have to be the main character, but they have to be the reason why these events progress. Um, there are obviously specific instances where uh, another character in the quest might do something and that might help but you want the player to feel like they're mattering basically um so use your best judgment when it comes to that i suppose um but err on the side of uh, giving the player kind of the control of the plot 
simple is better than complicated. People can really get behind a, you know, a simple idea. Um, but it, complicated when it isn't done right can come off very confusing. Um, and sometimes even when complicated is done right, it still comes off as confusing. Um, you know, just look at the movie Tenet. Um, I realize that's a movie, but, you know, you can definitely draw parallels between screenwriting and uh, and game writing. Tenet was a movie that was very well thought out, to put it simply. Um, but it wasn't... It didn't come across across right to the audience. It, it was uh, maybe almost intentionally confusing. People didn't like not being able to understand the movie, um, even if all their questions were technically answered in the movie. Um, and then that's why there were so many polarizing, you know, reviews around it, in my opinion. Um, but you don't want your players to be confused by what your plot is. You want them to follow your plot, probably. I mean, unless you don't. Um, <laughs> you you want to make sure that the story is progressing in a way that makes sense and things aren't going off, you know, off kilter for some reason. Um, and like I said before, uh, concepting your story will help keep things within the scope of what you're trying to achieve. One big question I also wanted to mention when it comes to concept and quests is think about what makes your quest unique. And it's uh, it's difficult because that's a very like creative. Uh, that's part of the creative side of writing. And um, uniqueness definitely contributes to how memorable something is whether it's the thing that makes something memorable is up to debate but it definitely helps with kind of sticking in your head i personally feel like a lot of the dark brotherhood quests from oblivion are very unique and i can remember like a lot of them um in skyrim a unique quest was a night to remember where you get drunk and you forget what you did the night before and you marry a hag raven you know that's a very unique quest um, and these types of quests stick out to the player for one reason or another as either being good because they're unique or good or, or they're just memorable. Even if it wasn't their favorite quest, they still remember it. Uh, and I think uniqueness really just kind of helps. It's something you want to aim for because if you're writing a pirate quest that has been done by like six or attempted to be done by you know, six different other writers in the same game you're writing or a murder mystery in uh, in a world where there are already a lot of murder mysteries, they might just kind of blend together. It's hard for you to stand out in that way. So NPCs. I'm going to be using some literary terms here that I learned specifically for this presentation. No, um, there's different kinds of characters there in, in a story. There's primary, secondary, and tertiary, but I'm gonna boil it down to just two for now um, because I think primary can encompass uh, both primary and secondary characters. So primary NPCs are involved in a story. <clears throat> they, they kind of they try to immerse the player. They focus on characterization or plot because they're the NPCs that are involved in quests. When I say story, I mean quest in this instance of the Elder Scrolls. Um, you want to make the character care about what is going on for one in in some way, shape, or form. Maybe there's something intriguing about the plot, or maybe there's something intriguing about the character. Regardless, you want to make these things your focus. It doesn't mean that other things can't be explored through this NPC, like world building, but it's probably going to sit heavily on the back burner of what you're trying to achieve, right? Um, 
The tertiary NPCs are the ones not involved in a story. They are the ones where you focus on world building or gameplay. And when I say gameplay, I mean like, uh, obviously like a quest is gameplay, which is what a primary NPC would be involved in. But when I say gameplay for tertiary, I mean mainly things like uh, NPC that owns a cabbage farm uh, or a cabbage patch. You, They say they'll pay you five gold for every cabbage you harvest and bring to them. That sort of thing. And then the player harvests cabbage cabbages and brings them to the person and then they get paid. Um, or it could just be like a vendor, like a wine vendor at a vineyard. Something simple like that. Um, Tertiary NPCs are a great opportunity for the world to feel very connected. Um, I'll go more in depth into each type in a second here, though. Um, understand which type you're writing because it helps organize your ideas and hone in on like what the point of the character is. Because uh, it is good for the player to understand. Like you want to veil it to an extent, but if they do decide to kind of look at your characters with a spyglass, they can figure out what exactly the point of this character is. If you look at a character, well, uh, like uh, Adrian Avenici, um, the blacksmith in Whiterun, you can tell that her kind of point is more focused on world building and gameplay. They do both because it's she talks about Yorlin Grayman uh, being better blacksmith than her essentially and that explains to you that there's another blacksmith in the in white run and that he's probably better but it tells you a lot of things um and with gameplay she's the one who sells you know wares and along with her brother who's inside so with primary npcs i have martin here on the side because he's a great example we'll talk about that um but these are the characters of a story a quest. Uh, could be a big story, could be a small story, which is like the secondary characters. Um, that's like Fandal and Sven. Since this is a since this is a love atom, I'll throw in a little. I'll throw in some love, you know. Um, Fandal and Sven are both people we are probably very familiar with. Um, two love smitten. Uh, people in uh in helgen uh on the intro and it's like one of the first quests air quotes that the player can uh can decide to participate in and it has a decision in it you know which is already pretty good um but they're obviously not a part of like a thing like a quest line right um like jarl balgriff would definitely be primary because he's in the smack center of the civil war and he shows up multiple times. He's a recurring character, whereas Feindal and Sven are more isolated in kind of their love triangle with Camilla. You know, what is... Think about what the story is for your quest, and how do these characters fit into it? And sometimes the story is built around the characters. So sometimes you can think of the characters and then build the story around them. Um, Oftentimes, I find that actually works the most uh, for me because it feels more organic, right? Um, it feels like the characters are actually kind of the driving forces behind what 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 the problem is. Um, like uh, Ulfric Stormcloak leading the rebellion. That's something that's very character driven. Um, and how does the player then, you know, join the civil war and how does he in how do they influence the uh the events that then the war that then takes place how can we make these characters relatable and how, this goes into how can we make people care about them right um you don't i won't make any absolute statements but you technically you typically don't want your uh main character to be someone that the player just hates, right? Because they're not going to care about whatever story you're trying to tell. Uh, they have to be relatable on some level. How do they develop? This is where we talk about Martin, because he's a character who is obviously very focused on character and plot. 
He is someone that the player is with from beginning to end, and the player is with them every step of the journey, uh, with him every step of the journey, right? He initially is a priest of Akatosh, doesn't know who he is. You tell him who he is, and he convinces you to save these people before he does anything you ask. He slowly kind of has this leadership arc where he realizes who he is and he accepts that responsibility. And then in the end, he, he sacrifices himself. Spoiler alert. Um, but it's a, uh, obviously there was more effort put into Martin than other characters in the story. And I think it's because the writers <laughs> at Bethesda realized that he was the one who deserved more attention, right? Um, they couldn't have gone that level of depth with every single character in the Elder Scrolls. You could make a compelling story around every single character in the Elder Scrolls, but sometimes you have to kind of realize that who the the main players in your story are, and you need to focus on those. Uh, focus on, I shouldn't say players, uh, focus on those characters, right? Tertiary. I mentioned uh, Adrian Evanici. With Tertiary, you can be obviously very creative and inspired. Um, there's no one formula to creating Tertiary NPC, but these are all kind of just my thoughts on it. Um, you can use the world around them as a crutch. I like to think of it as uh, to make them interesting. It might have kind of a negative connotation, but... Um, sometimes it really is difficult to just make a character interesting on their own uh, with no outside influences. Um, try to use kind of the locations around them. You could literally use the house next door as something that makes them interesting. Imagine if Adrian Evanici was for some reason like sneaking off in the middle of the night and hiding in Bree's home. Like the white run player home like why would you know why would she be doing that um even if she wasn't a blacksmith right uh that you would then know her as the weird lady who breaks into the player's home and you know sleeps there at night and then like when you buy it you like find her there or something um that was a random spitball off the top of my head <laughs> uh the culture of where they live relationships with other people uh etc um you can use it to build the larger region around them with culture. You can have it be very relationship focused, or you could have them just be weird and be like a weird beggar that uh, only speaks in rhymes, right? Um, this is a great opportunity to make the world feel more connected. And I encourage that because if there's a, uh, if there's a, lady in the street and she tells you that she or <laughs> Nazim uh, if there's a Nazim walking in the street and he says do you get to the cloud district very often um you know that there is a cloud district and uh Nazim's kind of a word um <laughs> can they serve kind of a greater gameplay purpose um what yeah this is what i was talking about before like uh like a vendor basically is a simple example but be creative with gameplay purposes like you can get really wild with this type of stuff where you can use maybe like the gift menu where you like give the npcs something um to like rather than just selling your cabbages maybe you like gift them to uh, your npc and for some reason that that's different, you know, like, how could that be? How, how can you make how can you be creative with your gameplay purpose? Um, there's a, a guard dying on the ground and you use the gift tab to give him a potion of healing, right? And then he drinks it because you gave it to him. Something like that. Dialogue. From NPCs to dialogue. Dialogue is the most important part of writing for the Elder Scrolls. Don't want to say absolutely, but definitely for the Elder Scrolls because it's your it is your primary 
your primary way to kind of deliver information. You know, you can concept a character all day. And I saw like a talk recently, a GDC talk, I think, where a guy talks about how um, how some of the best writing he's ever seen is on design docs where you're concepting your character, right? It doesn't even make it to the player. And that's really unfortunate, you know, because you want your good writing to make it to the player. You want your, you want the things you've designed on your design docs to make it to, to, to make it to the player's eardrums. Uh, you want to be able to deliver it to them in some way, shape or form, whether that be a dialogue or even just flavor text or something that they see, you know, uh, an action at night, a woman sneaking around, uh, trying to give them information in any way, shape, or form. But dialogue is your primary way of delivering that to the player. Tips writing dialogue. Dialogue should be succinct. Basically, less is more. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of submissions uh, that you know us writing teachers have read all throughout you know, my time here where um, there's redundant wording or there's sentences that are trying to say the same thing. Uh, but students don't realize that they could just leave it to one line and that will be good enough. You know, the message will be received. Um, you want to realize that when you're writing dialogue, um, if you write a line and then you kind of realize that you could write the line in a different way right below it, you probably want to get rid of the first line. Um, and you want to also focus on naturalness, natural, naturalness, if that's a word. Um, cause when you're done, you want to read it out loud. I feel like a lot of students definitely don't read their dialogue out loud. Uh, because if they did, I think they would definitely realize um, some of the kind of awkward wording that comes about. I feel like it might just be for me, but I enjoy kind of reading what I've written. Because if you don't read what you've written, you know, what? what's to say that I want to read what you've written, right? <laughs> you You should want to read what your own writing, right? If you if you're confident about it, it should be something that you like doing and you should, you should definitely do it going forward. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. Uh, offer interaction, not long monologues. Like, uh, you don't want the line to go on for more than a minute, at least not just the line, but like if you, if the player selects a dialogue option, you don't want it to, to drag on for a long amount of time, or if it does and you know it's going to, you want to give the player an opportunity to back out or inquire for more information, basically, because you don't want to lock them into a super long monologue where you ask, how's your day been? And then you expect like a one line response and then they start talking about, you know, their traumatic events in the Great War. You know, you want to, you want to make sure that they know that they're about to start to start talking about those traumatic events in the great war. Right. Uh, so they don't just have to keep escaping through your dialogue. Um, those are my writing tips uh, for dialogue. Um, back to the general advice slides. This is the thing that I said I would show to you at the end because we are nearing that end. Um, if you take nothing away from this presentation, know that your writing is subject to change. Get comfortable with rewrites. Um, you want to make sure you submit complete work. Raise that bar. You know, have high standards for your own work because the writers who are also editors will really... Uh, editors will thank you, first of all, so they don't have to keep editing your work. It'll take off their workload. And then writers who are also editors have a better eye for the, the mistakes that other writers make. Um, and you want to assume the worst. Uh, make sure that you are thinking about the logic of your quests because there's lots of quests that make it into 
editing actually um that you know will have dead ends and that's just like that's that's literally leaving like an entire branch for uh editors to kind of make up on their own um so you definitely want to make sure that you are thinking about the implementation perspective you never want to get contacted by an implementer and say this is broken right you know uh that that's not a good feeling so that's all i got presentation wise any questions thoughts <laughs> writing theories or lore conspiracies <laughs> Is there lasagna in Skyrim? Uh, I actually don't know. I didn't. I didn't scroll any further than that when I was uh, <laughs> when I was looking at the thread. I thought the first response, you know, from the admin was good enough. I think the uh, if I could add one point to being succinct with dialogue is um, oftentimes, uh, yeah, like it, it's true. You want to say. I, I I almost want to say more than less is more. Like you can say, you can bring out so much more. Yeah, no, actually, that is literally what I want to say. <laughs> you can bring out so much more with less. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that is like an end goal. Um, and I notice I notice as well um, students who maybe you will want to elaborate maybe you will want to be emotional maybe you are reading it out loud and you're like oh i would say i would go off on this guy and i would say you know like um what you you uh you snuck into this house and oh i'm gonna be so ruined now oh my mom's gonna hate me oh this this and that and uh like sometimes sometimes it's it is really tempting to like keep things for emotional purposes um, but yeah, I just really want to stress the point that it is really important to um, look at your work after you've written it and say, okay, what's the message here, actually? Like, can I say the same message with half of this to the player, right? Because our, like what Diegler was saying with fun, you, you want to respect the player's attention span in a lot of ways. You know, like we don't we don't want to immediately write stuff that requires a short attention span but like he said like expecting the worst um it all plays into this theme yeah because you got to think about the type of people <laughs> who who will play who will play your game right um you can never obviously think of every single type of person that would play it but there are people who uh will not you know really care about the character that you that you've written you know there will be someone like that who shows up um and you can't really account for those kind of people who just open the dialogue they're like oh you're a farmer and then you just and then they just close it you can't really fix that but um just know that they're out there is all i'm saying and uh uh try to hook them you know that kind of player hook them somehow you know make them stay around and listen to the farmer's traumatic great war stories um it will, uh, you know, one, one example I used to have actually, um, was Barbus, the, uh, Clavicus Vile, um, Daedric quest in Skyrim. There's, uh, I forget the, the town. It might be Falkreath, um, where you just are right outside and, um, a dog walks up to you and starts talking, right? That's pretty interesting they still had a rejection option for Barbus the dog because they knew that some players would be like, you know what? There's a dog talking to me. I'm just going to, I'm just going to dip because I don't want to deal with this right now or some reason, you know, maybe they were doing something else. Um, as interesting as you can be, sometimes you have to make sure that you you're offering a player uh, a way out. Um, and I just think that's really interesting because you, no matter how interesting you can be, there's always that constant uh, battle. Yeah, it's like cool. giving giving players consent. It's uh, important, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah. So. Ooh. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Um, I want to chime in there, um, especially with like, um, I suppose monologue. So you know 
having NPCs monologue. Um, the the idea of you know less is more is really important here. Um, generally, I've been told to keep it under forty seconds and or under like five. Um, I suppose bullet points. Like you know, you you go from like one point one to one point five, and that's like you know the kind of space you have. Um, with um, the example of Hamera Mora being like you know the don't do this type of situation. Um, you know, if if you encounter Hamera's Mora in like you know base Skyrim after I don't know after getting the the Elder Scroll from the main quest, it's like he talks and talks and talks. And what makes it worse is that he's talking so slowly. <clears throat> so, you know, um, when you write dialogue, you kind of want to be, you know, you want to be as precise as possible and, you know, just keep it short and sweet. Yeah, I, I uh, almost want to know if there was a first draft of that Hermes Mora dialogue and if it was worse. Yeah, well, that's definitely something... That's like a subject in itself. Uh, characters who uh, the players write, who essentially they're they're very grandiose in their kind of premise, and it's very uh, it's very appealing to just start writing. You know, just like blah, 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 like monologues, like I am the great Hermaeus Moore. You know, like you just keep keep kind of piling words on top of each other but in the end with something someone as you know all powerful as Hermaeus Mora you actually want to keep it keep it light because the more you say with a character the actually higher risk you have of kind of destroying the appearance that they have um to the player uh you know if you walk up to a, a thug in uh in a tavern and he looks really intimidating. And then you talk to him and he talks about how much he loves smelling flowers and prancing through meadows. It's like, oh, well, my perception of you is completely destroyed, Mr. Orc man with a battle axe. You know, <laughs> uh, you, you, you have uh, the power to change how someone sees someone based on what they say. And uh, that with Daedric Princes, that actually happens a lot. It's a kind of a tricky subject. Um, but yeah, so I can uh, open up some past student, um, and I know I can open up certain ones because they're teachers now. Um, I think I'm going to open up uh, Amicus's um, previous quest. Let's see here. Well, uh, may I add something on while you're pulling that up that you had brought up earlier? Sure. Uh, just at least for how I work in any sort of writing I do, whether it's for this or not, uh, in regards to the importance of narrating the stuff out loud, trying to remember that whatever you're writing, especially in the case of this project, is more than likely going to be said by a voice actor. So you narrate it out loud to know, does this actually sound good? It's so easy to write something, and then when you narrate it out loud, that just sounds like crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> putting it putting it lightly. Yeah, um, it's true. Uh, you you want to make sure you're speaking it out loud for the voice actor's sake as well. I've written um, for characters that are a certain race, like a red guard, and they I'll start writing them as if I think they're like a, an imperial an imperial like the way an imperial will talk but then i realized that oh you know red guards actually do have a different way of speaking and imagining like a red guard as i've come to understand them in the past uh through skyrim and oblivion like they they just would not say these lines in the way that i'm writing them you know like i could not imagine the voice actor for those people saying it saying these words to me um so it's uh definitely helpful for, I think uh, that's like extremely important with Khajiit's uh, handbooks. Yeah. We'll uh, agree with oh, me here. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, we had that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Khajiit when, talks weird. Yeah. So <laughs> when Khajiit, uh, especially when you um, you know say it out loud. So the the thing with Khajiit is that they kind of switch between 
um, oh. Akaji's name. So, you know, if you have like a, a Akaji called, I don't know, Abdro, it's like, you know, Abdro thinks this and that. And um, you want to switch that out sometimes with um, this one and just, you know, Kajit things. So um, it's probably best if you need, if, sorry, if you know, um, you alternate be between those three things. Um, and, you know, you don't um, have too many of the same, um, I suppose, you know, sayings in a row. So if you have like three sentences in a row where the, the Khajiit calls themselves like this one, it gets very stale. And that's something that you can easily uh, pick up on and, you know, just notice when you're reading out loud things. Especially if you try to, um, you know, to mimic a Khajiit accent. Yeah, definitely. I actually, you know, being a Cyrodiil writer, I hadn't had to write a Khajiit for a long time while I was on project and I uh just like a month ago wrote my first one and uh I had a lot of fun with it <laughs> because uh it was something new something that I hadn't actually had to do before um and yeah they're the way different characters speak uh is definitely important I'm wondering Pat do we have a uh Adam chat or should I just use the voice text uh voice text is fine or electrical text Okay. Let's do lecture. So if I'm understanding right, we shouldn't expect an orc from a big stronghold to speak with a posh British accent. Well, you know, you can you can break it sometimes, but you gotta give a good reason, right? You know? Uh you wanna make sure that you're not uh just doing it for the sake of um I wanna choose my words carefully here. Uh, you don't want to do it just to, that's the only thing that's interesting about them. You want to give it a reason, you know, um, as to why it is that way. And, um, yeah. Yeah. The, the more serious, uh, way of just, you know, keep the writing in line with the character you're writing, not what sounds cool or interesting or funny at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I just put a link to this in um, in chat. Um, well, actually, let me... Yeah, that's fine. Um, this was uh, an example written by uh, Amicus a long time ago. Uh, and it's definitely a good example of a quest that is contained uh, within itself. Um, it's one that I've used in the past, and I could probably find a more up-to-date example, but um, it's something that I feel uh, is a good example of choice when it comes to quests and not overstaying its welcome and introducing payoffs when they're necessary. He introduces... Uh, the quest is called Choir Act. It's all about um, kind of this choir at... Um, at a sort of a priory and um they're really scared of these thalmor you know the thalmor oh like i hate the thalmor but like they've definitely they're definitely in way too many quests but um that's because i think most of the time they aren't used in a way that is effective um and i think in this sense uh in this specific instance they're used in a way that is uh interesting in that they're harassing this priory um, for one reason or another, and the sisters of the priory can't sing their choir act very well because of it. Um, and whether or not this is something that is actually possible implementation-wise, it was definitely unique because of its kind of choir um, element. And uh, obviously, I've I've said in the presentation that you want to prioritize uh, or not prioritize, but you want to make sure that implementation pers you have an implementation perspective that shouldn't hinder your creativity is something I want to make clear. You know, um, if you try something as a writer and then the implementer says that it is impossible, then okay. Yeah. You might want to stay, take a step back, but um, you should be as creative as you want, but think about 
how you think it would work uh, implementation wise. And um, he uh, goes into detail as to how, you know, he thinks certain things uh, would work um, with with kind of the choir singing and whatnot. Um, but yeah, you basically uh, have to decide whether you want to uh, the the sisters ask you to help get rid of the Thalmor. Um, so you go to the Thalmor, you negotiate, and during negotiations, you have the choice to just switch onto the side of the Thalmor and go back and um, uh, take care of the sisters for them. Uh, you bring the head of one of the sisters back to the Thalmor because, you know, uh, they can't do it themselves, probably for legal reasons or whatever. Um, but uh, or you can just have the um, have the morality to tell the Thalmor to back off. Uh, and there's this uh, very kind of charming negotiation sequence where you can make a lot of decisions and uh, there's lots of different payoffs. If you help the sisters, uh, they sing the the choir act in its glory, in all its glory, because uh, now they're not scared. Now their voices aren't like quivering at at the at the sight of the Thalmor. Um now you hear this very, you know, lovely kind of uh harmony that all these uh ladies are in. And then if you help the Thalmor, you basically get, you know, lots of gold and I think uh some other specific rewards. Um so that's uh, some uh, an example of what I think is something that's very focused. I read something very recently as well, which I thought was very focused. Um, if Libero, not to call you out on this, is in here, I'm not sure if they are actually. No, they are not. Um, oh, yeah. Libero wrote a yeah wrote a very short quest about um, goblins pretending to be trolls, and. Uh, there were there was this guy who gives the player the quest walking along a path and then he sees these trolls so he he he's carrying this bag and he drops the bag and he runs because he didn't want to die to trolls the player goes to investigate the drop site and he finds out that it's just a bunch of goblins you know pretending to be trolls and this guy just in the heat of the moment mistook them for trolls and they were doing it with like like scarecrow dummies basically and um like talking through like horns and stuff like that to make their voices deeper so um the quest knows that it's very silly right um they established that from the very beginning um and as the player is kind of going through, they get to kind of participate in the silliness and make a decision as to how the quest ends and concludes. Um, there's lots of, you might have a lot of good ideas. It's always good to condense those ideas into, or even just cut it down to one idea. Like this quest is about love. Feindal, Sven, and Camilla, right? Love triangle, classic. Um, if you start introducing like, some random hobo who's trying to uh, poison Camilla Vera, uh, Camilla, you know, for for some completely unrelated reason, but it's in the same quest. It's it, it feels unfocused. Like, why would you just because you can poison and kill Camilla doesn't mean uh, there should be a hobo, you know, that allows that option immediately. Um, I think it would detract from the experience because you are doing, you're making such a decision to at, at the expense of, you know, player agency and stuff like that, um, which player agency is a whole, whole other can of worms uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to that. So honestly, I think that's all I have for uh, this presentation. Uh, you have about 10 minutes until the next one.